afternoon. Welcome to another Sunday School on Saturday here at New Foundation Christian Center. Today we're going to be talking about Jesus and the centurion. Jesus heals a centurion's servant. So before we get into our lesson, let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for another Sunday School on Saturday. We thank you, O oh Lord, for each ear that will hear, O oh Lord, each heart that will receive. Father, we thank you for all those that took that have taken the time out, O oh God. Father, we praise you, Lord, for this lesson that reminds us, O oh Lord, that you are a healer, O oh God, that reminds us, O oh God, to put our trust and our faith in you, O oh God, believing that you are able. We thank you and give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as I mentioned, our lesson today comes from, our lesson today is talking about Jesus, and the title of our lesson is Jesus Heals a Centurion's Servant. And our lesson today comes from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. So, as you grab your Bibles and your Bible apps, you can turn to Luke 7, verses 1 through 10. Um, this may be, of course, a familiar lesson to some people, but it's really good for us to just be reminded of Jesus as a healer, to be reminded of how our faith should be in Jesus as our healer, just as the centurion. So, as I said, Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, and um, one, um, as I as as we as we go into our lesson, please understand that the Lord is able to heal people, and that it's important for us to um, it's important for us to utilize our faith in believing that God will heal when we do pray for healing. Amen. All right, our lesson. Um, I'll start by reading verse one. It says, now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. Of course, the he they're talking about here is Jesus. So at this time, um, Jesus had completed um, an extensive teaching ministry outside of Capernaum. And now he's entering into Capernaum. And that's where our lesson picks up right now. He's entering into Capernaum. Okay. Verse 2. Oh, before we get into verse two, how about we talk about verse one? <laughs> how about we talk about a little bit about the, the book of Luke? All right. So um, the book of Luke, uh, it's important for us to understand uh, the author's audience. And so we can kind of understand the direction that they're taking in, in, in laying out the lesson. Okay. So in Luke's books, in both of his books, he emphasized that Gentiles as well as Jews have been included in the family of faith. And that's important for us to understand because we, uh, the the centurion, he was a Gentile, and he, it, the people who came to him as the uh, as advocates, if you will, for the centurion were Jews, two different people, two different sets of people. Typically, Jews and Gentiles did not mix. Typically, Jews and Gentiles had no contact with each other. But Luke wanted to emphasize the importance that um, the word came not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. So his emphasis, he emphasized that Gentiles as well as Jews have been included in the family of faith. It's important for us to keep that in mind. All right. Now, verse 1, as we already said, Jesus is entering into Capernaum after, after this extensive ministry that he did. So after these activities, he entered the city of Capernaum. And that's where we are right now. He's entered the city. Now, as he entered, let's go to verse 2. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. Now, listen. I just mentioned that this centurion was a Gentile. However, and this is this is going to come out in this lesson. This is just going to be laid out in this lesson. The faith of this centurion that Jesus would heal his servant. And we're going to we're going to not only just see how it was laid out, but we're going to see not just the evolution of his faith cuz he had faith to believe that Jesus could heal him, but the evolution his faith evolved. And we're also going to see the evolution of his humility as well. We're going to see that Keep keep listening. Keep watching, okay? All right. 
So the centurion. So as a centurion, as a centurion, he was in charge of a hundred Roman soldiers. That was his job as a centurion. Um, this centurion had a genuine heart of concern for his servant and did not view him as someone who could be easily tossed aside or replaced. And that's important because typically in, in this particular era, uh, servants were considered um, less than. And the fact that this, man's, this man had enough care and concern for his servant that he wanted him to heal, to be healed, says a whole lot about the centurion. All right. Okay. So, and that's verse, verse two. Okay. His love for his servant, his fear of God, his respect for the Jews, and his generosity to them all speak to the fact that he was an exception to the rule when it came to the Roman soldiers of the day. He was an exception to the rule. He was an exception to those who, to, to, to other centurions and also to other, the, those uh, others who had servants as well. He cared for the centur for, for the centurion care for his servant and he also cared for the Jewish people. We're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about that too as we go on. It tells us, of course, that uh, he's um, in verse two that um, he, the servant was, the centurion servant was dear to him. He was highly valued to him. And isn't it, isn't it just wonderful? Isn't it just great when you're highly valued enough by someone that they would intercede for you, that they would pray for you? It's such a blessing when someone is so concerned about you that they pray for you. So when someone, when, when, when you're going through things and someone tells you that they're praying for you, don't take that lightly. Take that as a blessing that someone takes the time out to go to God on your behalf. And of course, that's not to say that you can't go to God on your own behalf. However, the Bible tells us that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. So imagine how powerful a prayer of not, not just your prayer, but the prayer of all those that are praying with you, for you, are. It's such a blessing when you know that people are praying for you, just being strengthened. Just Sometimes it's, it's you're strengthened in knowing that people take the time out to pray for you. Amen. Amen. Let's go. Let's keep going. All right. Okay. Um, now, this uh, about, a little bit about this, this, the, the centurion's servant. He was sick with the palsy with, um, and terribly tormented by whatever this disease was. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about the parallel scripture. So in Matthew, it, it tells us that the centurion, it, Matthew, because we're in Luke, that's what our lesson is in. And Matthew says that the centurion personally came to Jesus. But Luke said that he sent his elders. What Matthew, um, Matthew simplified the story. Um, apparently and made by, by, by making his representatives equivalent to the centurion himself. So there was a simpl simplification there. So there's not a discrepancy. And I want you to look at it as a discrepancy that one said one thing and one said the other. It was just, it was just a simplification by Matthew. Okay. All right. So the relationship between the, his, this Roman military man and the leaders of the Jewish people, um, between between those two, the relationship between the centurion and the leaders of the Jewish people he helped oversee reveals a unique situation. Instead of the usual animosity, there was a genuine camaraderie and a high degree of respect between them. So that was contrary to what typically was going on. These elders came to earnestly beseech Jesus to respond to this man's need. To respond to this man's need and that is in verse 3 and when he heard of Jesus he sent him the elders of the Jews beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant when he heard of Jesus we've, we've more than just heard of Jesus we've more than just heard of him what are we doing to beseech him what are we doing to beseech him on behalf of others or do we care enough or have the concern enough for others that we would beseech Jesus 
on their behalf? Do we care enough about them? Or are we so consumed by our own situations and own circumstances that we can't take the time out for others? I've, I've noticed that there's just been this ongoing theme, if you will, of people saying, well, I don't have time to be dealing with other people's situations. I have my own situations to deal with. I get that and I understand that. However, we can't get so caught up in the selfishness of what's happening to us that we can't see the need of those around us and pray to pray to God on their behalf or be concerned about them to the point that we can we can beseech God on their behalf there's always going to be things that are going on and that are happening in our lives our lives are not perfect because we live in a fallen world so there will always be situations and circumstances there are always going to be things that are happening that we need to take control over or to 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 handle if you will however if we allow those things to overtake us or overwhelm us to the point that we can't look out for the for the needs of others then if we if we try to wait until well we, i'll just wait till i'm not going through things if you wait until you're not going through things then you'll never be able to to, to help meet the needs of others please don't don't get caught up in your own circumstances that you can't beseech god on behalf of others Amen. Amen. All right. We're still in the lesson. Amen. All right. Uh, let's go to verse verses 4 and 5. Verse 4 tells us, and when, he, and when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this, saying that the centurion was worthy. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue so they were they were they were going to jesus letting jesus know this centurion he did this for the jewish people because he did this you know please meet the meet the need that he's asking they were they were um they were they were showing the worth of the centurion which is interesting um because the centurion himself we'll find out a little later felt that he wasn't worthy for jesus to come to him well, I don't want to get too far in the lesson, but that's part of the lesson. That's a little later. We're going to get to that. Okay. Uh, verse, so, v verse 4. Uh, the Greek word besought, where he said they besought him instantly. It means to draw near in order to implore. So they were, they were, they were drawing near to him in order to implore him. The elders were urging Jesus to respond to their requests. There was an urgency there. Do we have an urgency? Do we have an urgency to, to draw near and to implore God on behalf of others? Their high regard for the centurion was displayed in their explanation that this man was worthy of receiving Jesus' help. They explained further that he had shown genuine love for the Jewish nation, especially in having built them a synagogue. So this man was a friend of the Jews. He was a friend of the Jews. And as a result, they went to Jesus on his behalf and they attempted to tell Jesus of this man's, this centurion's worthiness to have his servant healed. Uh, this centurion was different. He cares for the Jews. It was just what I just said. All right, so an interesting change, and, and, and regarding the book of Luke, it says an interesting change was suddenly taking place in Luke's gospel. Up to this point, Jesus has been portrayed as dealing exclusively with the Jews, up until that point. But now he is shown beginning to pay attention to Gentiles. Because remember I said that Luke emphasized that Gentiles, as well as Jews, have been included in the family of faith. This is where that, that shift happens. Um... And so that, that's where that shift happens. Okay, and that's verse 5. Okay. All right, all right, verse 5. Verse, verse let's go on to the, as we get into this evidence of the faith. Verse 6 tells us, Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. 
That's verse 6. And that's where the evolution of his humility evolved. His humility evolved because remember they were they were imploring Jesus. They were trying to the 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 Jew, the, the 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 friends that he sent. They were trying to let Jesus know how worthy this centurion was. And as Jesus was on his way, the centurion sent word saying that he's not even worthy for Jesus to enter his house. He's not even worthy. He recognized his own humility and said he's not even worthy for him to enter his house. That doesn't mean he, he was saying that he didn't want the servant healed. Yes, this is where the this is where the and then this is where the faith evolved. It went from having Jesus to come directly to let's go to go on to the rest of the lesson. To verse seven. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. I'm not gonna get ahead of myself. Let's go to verse six. Let's go to verse six. Let's back up. This is this is an exciting lesson. You know, like I said, this is a familiar, maybe a familiar lesson for some. But sometimes we just need those reminders about our faith and 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 how we have to activate our faith or utilize our faith when we're looking and looking to God to move on our behalf or on behalf of others that we're praying for. Verse 6, um, I just read that. So he sent some friends uh, with another message. He felt unworthy that Jesus should enter his house. It is quite clear that the centurion knew who Jesus was. He had come to recognize him as the son of God, whereas most of the Jews had not. Is that not interesting? And, we'll, and, and Jesus is going to talk about that a little later in verse, verse 9. So while the Jews and uh, while the Jews and especially their leaders exhibited uh, racial limits, Jesus had come for all people, Gentiles as well as Jews. Jesus came for everyone. So without hesitation, he went. He went without hesitation. There was no hesitation in him going to 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 meet the needs of this of this man to meet the needs to to heal this man's servant without hesitation. What am I saying? I'm saying that God's word comes without hesitation, and and and, and we know that in Daniel, Daniel chapter ten verses twelve to to thirteen, the angel of the Lord he was delayed in coming. However, he still came. Amen. Verse uh, Psalm 147 15 it says he sends his command to the earth his word runs swiftly God word comes without hesitation so if you're waiting to hear of the word of God from God know that his word is coming it comes without hesitation there there, there, there may seem to be a delay but the word is coming amen amen it come, that without hesitation, Jesus went without hesitation. The word went without hesitation. Jesus himself was going without hesitation. And we'll know a little later in the lesson. Actually, let's just go to this verse, verse 7. Wherefore, neither, I, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. And this is the centurion talking. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. This centurion had enough Faith to believe and remember this centurion is a Gentile he had enough faith to believe that Jesus didn't have to come that all he had to do was send his word and his servant would be healed that is the evolution of the man's faith the evolution of his faith was the fact that he wanted Jesus to come to heal his servant but he th his faith evolved to the point where he said just send the word and my servant will be healed amen And just like the faith of the centurion, we have to have faith to believe that God, if he just, that all we have to do is pray and God will send his word. Have enough faith to believe that his word is coming. Even though it may not come in the time that we expect it, there is still no delay. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's go to verse, verse, uh, verse eight. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's talk about verse seven. I just read verse seven. <laughs> Verse 7, it says that um, he did not even feel worthy. We talked about that. He knew that all Jesus had to do was say the word and his servant would be healed. 
This Gentile knew that. This Gentile had enough faith to believe that. Um, this was a major statement of faith on his part, showing the depth of his understanding of the person of Jesus. How deep is your understanding of the person of Jesus? How deep is your understanding of the person of God? How deep is your understanding of the person of Holy Spirit? We have to have a, an understanding of these individuals in order for our faith to be activated, in order for, our, in order for us to operate in faith. Because he had a, 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 a understand, he showed it showed the depth of his understanding of the person of Jesus. He believed that Jesus didn't even have to come; that Jesus could just speak a word, and that his servant would be healed. His comprehensions of Jesus' authority came from his own experience with human authority. So he utilized his own experience, his own human experience, his own earthly experience. He used, utilized his own experience to understand or to comprehend Jesus' authority. And let's go further into that. He says in verse 8, he says, For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. So, this is this... Uh, Centurion's understanding of authority. And because of this Centurion's understanding of authority, it says that uh, the implication here is that Jesus held, held ultimate authority over disease and that diseases were obligated to respond exactly the way he expected and told them to. The, the Centurion recognized that Jesus had the same kind of authority over diseases that the Roman government had over him and that he had over those that uh, had over his subordinates. So the same way he in his earthly um, or earthly authority, the centurion in his earthly authority was able to tell tell the people to do what to, to, to give orders and have those orders follow. He he knew that Jesus had that same authority over disease and that disease was obligated to do obligated to do what Jesus told it to do and that was to lead the man's the sir his servant's body. Whew, okay. All right. It's all right. Whew. He used himself as the illustration of his understanding. He was both under authority and had others under his authority. So he fully comprehended what was expected when a command was given by the one with the authority to give it. Jesus had the authority to give the command. The centurion understood what what happened when the one who had authority to give the command gave the command. He understood that whatever needed to happen was supposed to happen and that it did happen. So he believed Jesus to give the command. Amen. Who Jesus. <laughs> All right. Let's go on to verse... <laughs> Verses, verse. Uh, let's finish up. Wrap up verse, verse eight. Okay, so in in just a couple of, in just a couple of sentences, the centurion displayed two characteristics of healing faith. First, he displayed humility, and he displayed the absolute belief in the power of Jesus to do whatever he desires. Absolute belief in the power of Jesus to do whatever he desires. Hmm. One of the things we have to understand when it comes to praying faith, praying, praying for healing and faith to believe healing, we have to understand that God has the ultimate decision and the ultimate choice. And we have to pray God's will concerning whatever we're praying. Amen. All right, moving on. Verse 9. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. From this Gentile, from the Gentile, 
Jesus was amazed at this insightful understanding. He marveled. When he said marveled, that Greek term, it carries the, the idea of being extraordinarily impressed and feeling great admiration. So Jesus was impressed by this centurion's faith. He was so impressed by it that he admired it. The, the Jews were supposedly looking for the coming of their Messiah, but the faith of this Gentile centurion far surpassed theirs. And that's in verse 10, where it says, and they that were, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, that's in verse 9, which is the verse we we're in, it says, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. So the, the demonstration of the faith of this Gentile was greater than the faith that Jesus had seen in Israel from the Jews. Yes. The centurion saw him for who he really was. Are we seeing Jesus for who he really is? Mm. <laughs> verse 10. Let me read verse 10. It said he recognized, let me, before I read verse 10, it said he recognized Jesus' absolute authority. Verse 10. And they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. He was healed. They found the servant healed. Jesus' word ran swiftly. And beat the servant, beat beat the friends back, beat those that were sent back home. His his word ran so swiftly that it, he had healed the servant, and the servant was already well by the time they had gotten gotten back to the centurion's home. Whew. The only thing that truly mattered to him was simple faith. To, oh, okay, I'm sorry. When, when the friends who had been sent to Jesus returned to the centurion's home. They found the servant healed. Jesus had honored the centurion's faith by immediately restoring the servant's health. The only thing that truly mattered to him was simple faith, specifically the ability, ability to believe that Jesus is who he says and that God will do what he says. That was, the, that was, the, that was what mattered to Jesus. The centurion recognized Jesus' absolute authority. We know that God, Jesus, that, that Jesus has absolute authority. Regardless of what we see, regardless of the things that we experience, regardless to what's happening in this world, please understand that God is in control. Please understand that the Lord Jesus has absolute authority. Please understand that. Like this centurion, like this Gentile who had enough faith to believe that his servant could be healed by a word. We have to have faith to believe that God will, God, not, not, not only will he do, but that God is able to do what he says that he will do. That he has the ability to do all. That he has absolute authority over all. Amen. Amen. All right. So please go back and reread this. Reread this text. Please reread this text. This is again, this is Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Please go back and reread re re this text with new eyes, with new understanding, with a new mind to believe that God, God, uh, to believe that God is able to do what he says that he will do to have faith and to have our faith increase that and, and to and to remember that we walk by faith and not by sight we're not concerned not to say we're not concerned but we're not being overwhelmed or we're not looking at the things around us and letting them make the decisions concerning who god is that we believe who god is based on god's word amen as we uh, thank you once again for joining us as we uh, end this lesson. Thank you once again for joining us each and every Saturday at 2 o'clock p.m. We thank you and we thank you for um, also joining us on Sunday mornings um, for our service. We're live in the sanctuary at 11 o'clock 
a.m. each and every Sunday at New Foundation Christian Center, 8145 Finkel in the city of Detroit, where our pastor is Dr. Marsha Hall and our First Lady's Evangelist Carolyn Hall. And we are also live on our social media platforms as well. We are streaming on our social media platforms as well. And we happen to be celebrating our pastor's uh, 32nd pastoral anniversary. Please Please join us in celebrating him and our First Lady as they celebrate 32 years. That's a long time to be doing something. I'm telling you, 32 years is a long time to be doing anything. So it is great to celebrate those who have chosen to, um, to serve the kingdom. For, 30, for To serve the kingdom for any amount of time, but to serve the kingdom for 32 years. That is truly a blessing. Also, on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m., please join us as we stream our Bible study each and every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. on our platforms. Thanks you for joining us. Thank you for joining us as we close out in prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we praise you, God, for, for the faith to believe, O oh God, that you are able. We thank you, O oh Lord. We pray that you increase our faith, O oh Lord. Father, that you help our unbelief, O oh God, that you that you help us, O oh God, to not be so overwhelmed with our own circumstances that we don't intercede for others, O oh God. Father, that we don't implore you on their behalf, O oh Lord. We thank, praise, and exalt you because you are our God, our Lord and Savior. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Join us once again. Amen.